Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? How are you? How are you? I'm good. How about you? Fine. Are we ready to start? Yes, and I, I'd like to uh, put it out up front that I have another meeting at 12. In fact, I was glad when you moved the meeting to 10. Because 10 or have, 3 or yeah, 3. Yeah, when you moved it here yeah, from 4.30 Four. to 3. Yes, yes. yes. So that last me time for my next meeting. Okay. Oh, good. Okay, good. So the next meeting, my meeting will start in two hours. So I'd like to leave 30 minutes before that time. Okay. Actually, I'm only on this call for 30 minutes. I'm only here 30 minutes. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm doing only half an hour. All right, cool. All okay. right. Um, yeah. So we can just start. Um, so I'll just quickly read out your profile and then we can just- Hi, write. Juliana. Hi, Bergen. Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to come. I appreciate it. Um, it's fine. Um, okay. Um, okay. Bebi Abakoba. Yeah. Junior is a regulatory oh, and yes. compliance professional and lawyer. She's called the Nigerian and UK bar. She's on the panel of neutrals at the Lagos Multidor Court and the Lagos Court of Arbitration. She has over 12 years professional experience in the banking and capital market sector in the United Kingdom and Nigeria. She's currently head of sports and entertainment tech practice at Olisa Bakoba Legal. She's a member of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. NESG sports thematic industry group on alternative dispute resolution and youth policy development. She's also a member of the Lagos Divisional Football Association. As a thought leader, she has contributed on several panels, such as the CNN Africa Freedom Day panel on sport, slavery, and trafficking. She has also written a paper titled Health Tech in Nigeria A Legal Perspective, which mirrors the current regulatory landscape for the health tech sector in Nigeria. She was also a panelist on the sports law session for the Benin chapter of the Young Bar Forum and the Stakeholders Roundtable on Sports Business and Dispute Resolution organized by the Lagos Chamber of Commerce International Arbitration Center, which she moderated. She's the author of several articles, her articles titled minors in football in Nigeria safeguarding their rights and securing the interest, their, their interest remains the most highly ranked article on sports slavery in Nigeria. Her interest in sports and youth development led her to set up the Lagos Tigers to Ball Club in 2012. She's also a legal and compliance writer, facilitator, and regularly gives lectures and shares her expertise through flagship programs such as the SME Radio and Sports Parliament. She also raises awareness on regulatory and compliance issues and the development of sport entertainment and technology law as an emerging practice in Nigeria for her numerous contributions to the development of sport and intellectual property in Nigeria. Beverly was recently presented with an award at the World Intellectual Property Day event hosted by friends of the Creator Artistic Foundation and NGO that has been supporting the development of intellectual property rights in Nigeria. You're welcome, Beverly. Um, you can start your presentation. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Um, sorry, I'm just putting on my headpiece. Okay, so um, Firstly, thank you for the introduction. It was really kind of you. And, um, you know, it's always nice to attend these sort of events to, um, you know, see how I can help inspire others who want to go into similar, into a similar um, area of practice as me or who just want to hear my story. So I guess I'll start with my story. So 
um, yeah, my journey, I've not always, um, I've not always practiced as a lawyer. Actually, you know what's really funny? Because of my kind of legacy, like my grandfather was um, a judge um, for the Southeastern region. And then my own father is a son. So I always felt like I had really big shoes to fill. And it's that same thing that you shouldn't, sometimes when you have a legacy ahead of you, it can frighten you or it can push you. So to begin with, it, it, it frightened me and inspired me at the same time. So I decided I would not do pure legal to start. I would do something soft, <laughs> something not too challenging. So I opted to do, I opted to do um, regulatory compliance. So I got started off in compliance when I graduated because I felt like it still got a bit of law, but I don't have to feel the pressure. I won't feel the direct pressure of, you know, being a lawyer and having, um, you know, these people that have come ahead of me. No one, there, there'll be less room for comparison. So I uh, went into compliance and compliance effectively is um, a profession where you are responsible for ensuring that the regulated um, industry that you're working in, so the company that you work for, you're responsible for making sure that they abide and comply, as the word compliance goes, with um, the internal regulatory framework of the company, as well as abides by the external regulatory framework. So I opted for banking and capital markets um, because I don't know, I just, I just had this passion for banking and um, capital markets. Um, very fascinated by the whole synergy between financial institutions, um, you know, and then anti-money laundering was something I also studied at university. I, um, my master's, I actually did a master's in commercial law. And one of my modules was um, anti-money laundering law. And it was very new. This was back in 2002. And I knew that I wanted to be in a profession where I'm defending, I'm policy making, you know. So I uh, found myself going into compliance to start because I thought, you know, I'm, I need to have my own, I have to have my own type of practice, my own niche. Um, I was worried about the shoes. I was worried about going directly into legal practice because, you know, big shoes to fill. So I avoided law to start with, funny enough. So I avoided it. And um, yeah, I worked in the UK for some time and um, I really enjoyed it. I, I would say to you that the foundation of everything that I, I do now as a lawyer still rests a lot on my initial um, foundation as a compliance officer. So as a compliance officer, um, you know, you're taught how to create rules. So you can be a lawyer, but you don't necessarily know how to create rules. You, you know how to interpret them, but you may not know how to write them. So I learned a lot about, um, you know, policy making, um, rules, regulations, um, I learned a lot about um, regulatory liaison, you know, and just, I also learned about, you know, things they don't really teach you at university, like how to speak publicly. <laughs> That's one thing I learned when I first started. I had to teach, because um, I worked at, um, when I first started my career, I was at PricewaterhouseCoopers, I was at PwC. And um, as you all know, it's one of the big four accounting companies, accounting and audit companies. And they make you, they are really big on, um, on personal development and training and development. They are big on it. So um, I found myself teaching people, you know, right from when I was, you know, a graduate um, joiner. So I credit PwC actually with my um, facilitation skills. So, you know, again, these are things that you don't necessarily pick up as a lawyer. So, so yeah, I mean, I did that for some time and then that's where I started feeling like, hmm, so maybe I still want to go into full-time law after all. And then the fear came back and I thought to myself, 
gosh, okay, maybe I'll just be a regulatory and compliance lawyer. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think um, Juliana did mention that I, I have a football club. Now that football club is actually the catalyst for leading me into sports law. So for me, um, my area of law, if I had gone down what I thought I was going down, would have been just banking, finance, law, corporate, commercial, the usual. But it's interesting because I, as I was trying, as I was finding my feet and trying to figure and navigate my way around, okay, what direction do I take? Notwithstanding that, I came into full-time legal practice as a mature person. So for people who think, oh gosh, you know, what do I do? I'm, I'm not even 30 yet and I don't know what I'm doing. Trust me, you're still young because I had already come into my mid thirties as, as a lawyer, as a practicing lawyer, trying to start from scratch to understand what direction to take. So you're never too old or you're never too young you know not to know where you are or to know where you're going okay so um so someone just said to me oh but you do you've been running a football club for some time why don't you do why don't you why don't you um bring that into your legal practice and i tell you it had never occurred to me <laughs> to combine my side passion or as people say side hustle i've never thought to combine it with um with my legal practice. So at this point, um, this is 2015, I had left compliance after 10 years and um, I decided I was going to go into full-time law practice. But I hadn't done my bar in Nigeria, but I had done it in the UK. So this is what I mean about, don't be afraid to sometimes make a decision that seems like, oh my gosh, I'm leaving everything I know and starting again from scratch, you know, because you never know, you're never too old or too young, I would say, to, um, to make some life-changing decisions. So yeah, so 2015 is when I made my decision. So you can, you can see I'd, been already, I'd already been working 10 years and then I decided, okay, I need to get to grips with what's going on in Nigeria. So it was at that point, I had already been running the football club that someone said, you know, you can combine that with what you're doing as a lawyer. And that was how the, um, the spark for sports law came about completely by accident. So I'd already started running it, but I never thought to fuse them together. So you, you get inspiration from like the, most unusual places, so to speak. But, um, but yeah, I mean, um, you may not necessarily have an interest in sports law or entertainment law like me, but whatever area you choose, um, it doesn't matter when you discover it, as long as at the time of discovery, you do everything you can to, to absorb the knowledge you need to absorb. You make your contacts, you network, um, one thing that has really helped me in coming into the practice of law at a later stage compared to most people is I leverage on my networks heavily. <laughs> and, and what I mean is, you know, I'd already established like, you know, connections. And so for instance, I was in compliance, right? In banking and capital markets. So I already had a huge network of people in SEC, um, NSC places like that so it was it was something I could easily just go back to but if I needed it say I had a client wanting to go into that particular area I already knew what to do I already knew all the steps so never underestimate the contacts you'll make along the way no one is too small at this stage i mean there's never you can never be too big but no one is definitely too small i mean numbers of everybody from the people at the door to the desk officers i had everything so when it came to infusing that area of my knowledge with the practice of law it was quite easy for me 
then you know with entertainment again my 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 interest in entertainment I, I suppose it's always been there I I love entertainment I and actually I love dance I love I just love entertainment from a consumer perspective but also from a business perspective because entertainment is so intricate there's so many ways of entertaining people our country is one big entertainment spot we everyone knows that Nigerians are full of life and we, we, we love life so entertainment is a huge part of our lives here so it makes sense that if you're going to do a niche area of law well for me then entertainment had to come into it because I already had that network again my you know my childhood friend from from school Kemi Adetiba I mean it was a no-brainer I, I said to myself if I'm going to be going into entertainment Kemi you have to be on my books <laughs> which I did, I did, I said to her, I'm sorry, you have to be on my books, you know. So um, it's so important that we learn to leverage. I've, I've realized one thing, being a lawyer, I think it's 50% <laughs> the network that you have because you could be the smartest lawyer on the planet, but if you don't know how to extend your reach, then your skills are just sort of there, lying dormant and not being used. Um, so so it initially was a struggle because you're setting up a completely niche practice. Sports, I mean, back in 2017, when I set up the practice here, I mean, the office now, you can see the back. When I set up the practice, you can see it, I'll just show you me and my dad in the back. <laughs> so um, when I set it up, gosh, it was, it was, it was crazy. Like, you know, we, we always say in Nigeria, we find it difficult to sell intellectual services because people don't appreciate intellectual services so you can imagine you're trying to sell something that has never really been sold before but you know you just keep on putting it out there raising awareness and then as lawyers we need to i'm assuming everybody here is a lawyer we need to leverage on tech we need to leverage on tech. We need to be on social media. I know there's the whole RPC. Where is the line between advertising and, you know, not advertising? But the thing is, as lawyers, we use our intellect a lot. We use our intellect to advertise ourselves. So you're going for speaking yeah. engagements. You're doing tweet chat, Twitter chats. You're doing Insta lives that's not technically advertising as long as you're speaking about the subject matter so i had to really get you know in, in innovative about how to put across that we have this new team and one thing that um you know we did a lot was um how do you call them like even like i know now we're in covid so we have to be careful about gatherings but we would hold like just a mini reception and invite people oh um, we've launched a sports entertainment and tech practice, invite media people, invite our law friends. In fact, that was how I met Liga of Niger at Edumade, and we've been good friends ever since. So I found that my, my, the kind of advice I would give to people who are you know, finding their feet in this legal journey and career is anyone can be successful as long as you follow certain rules. Um, don't ever think anyone is too small to talk to because the small person you're talking to today could be like a CEO tomorrow. Um, be systematic in everything you do. Even if you are doing um, briefs and they're not paying you great. And I know there's that whole debate about don't accept briefs that are below you. Look, at the end of the day, I don't encourage it, but if you have to do what you have to do, fine. But whatever you do, don't treat a brief that is low paying with disrespect. The respect you give to a 10 million naira brief should still be the same respect you give to a 100,000 naira brief. It doesn't matter, you know, because that way that you keep getting called back over and over again, especially when you're trying to build your name. So when we were trying to, when my practice was trying to, to, to build a name for itself, you know, we would take almost anything. But what we would deliver differently is, you know, we would put all our heart and soul into it as if, you know, they were paying us huge amounts of money. And then before you know what's happening, you, you gain, you gather respect, people respect you, you start getting um, um, referrals. So, so yeah, my journey into um, legal 
um, like full-time legal practice in Nigeria has been quite unusual. And yes, to that 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 whole fear I had in the beginning about not walking in shoes that were big for me and not wanting to be looked at as oh this is the daughter of so 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 and she's clearly a rubbish lawyer and you know not wanting to practice to begin with because I was so worried about that I'm happy that in a way I finally com- I confronted my fears and found something that was for me so sports and training and tech is nothing like what you know my father does nothing it's nice to be able to actually teach him something for once so I would say let let's never let don't ever be driven by fear like I I do admit that um I didn't go into litigation for that same reason because I was so worried about not being a good enough litigator and I actually think I would have been a good one you know but I've I I have but all is not lost I've, I've got into um alternative dispute resolution which is more suited for my line of practice which is sport and and I and I do quite well I, I speak well I'm objective so don't ever be driven by fear um you know that's that's one big lesson that I've learned you know in my short <laughs> career um wow. yeah yeah. Thank you so much, Beverly, for sharing your journey in the sports space. And especially um, while I was doing your profile, there was something I saw that you are a mother of two. Yeah. yeah. So I know that it's also easy to combine motherhood and practice and all that. So well done. Well done for what you do and for the role that you're um, playing in the sports sector and for. Um, doing a lot, not just for yourself and your family and your firm, but also for legal practice and for showing people how things can be done. Um, so I'll quickly go to the mentees and I'll ask them to ask two two questions each, so that okay. you can ask the questions and then you can go ahead to answer. Yes. So um, Rebecca, Don, and Daniel. Um, so any of you can just start. Just um, introduce yourself and ask two questions. By the way, we have Mrs. Uche here. She's she's also a mentor and she has been with us since the beginning of the second quarter and we are so lucky to have her also with us today. Thank you, Ma. Thank you. Thank you, Ma. So Rebecca, Dawn and Daniel, please quickly ask your question. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. for the lecture. Thank you, Mrs. Juliana. Uh, my question is this. I, I never really considered sports law before. I, I've never done any research in that area. And frankly, I was really surprised when um, we saw the flyer and were inviting me to come who's into sports law. So I did a quick research on sports law. And I found that there are a lot of areas of law that actually apply in sports industry. So it's more like a combination of different subject matters, subject matters of law, yeah. with contracts and the rest of it. So as in Nigeria, for part of Nigeria, which aspect of sport law um, is more obtainable? It's practicable, it's working right now, and is more advisory for one to consider in terms of practicing. Okay, great, uh, great question. Great question. You can also ask your second question. Then we move to Dawn and Daniel so that she can answer everything together. Mm. I already answered my first question. In the lecture, so. Okay. Um, Dawn and Daniel. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Daniel Wale. I first I want to um, my questions are first. I want to ask is because I actually saw that you also mentioned the fact that one of the reasons you had passion for sports. And so I just want to ask um, is passion enough to 
Well, into sports now. There are some of us that are like we are fans of several clubs that are adding to the internet. So, is um, are we living your passion? Is passion um, sufficient? Is it is, that, is it an enough push? Yeah, we just put no. That's my first question, and my second question is um, I think the element just said that there are several areas of law that are interwoven with sports law, and I, I think um, that is true. Why I want to I want to ask like um, what are those areas of law that you have enough knowledge to keep more to go to sports law? Those areas of law. I can't hear you well, Daniel. Okay. okay. Maybe I should repeat myself. Okay, I said my first question is, is passion enough to delve into sports now? Because some of us are really passionate about football. We you know, I mean, we find a lot of people, that, I don't know, I don't want to go to like, gender based, but a lot of guys who are so much interested in football, we can argue football from now to tomorrow. Is it enough to push to go into sports law? Um, the second question is, um, like I said, like the fellow manager just said, that the areas of laws that are in the open, find some areas of law, contract, that you also find them in sports law. I just want to ask that, um, what are those, maybe are there, what are those specific areas that we should totally take note of, or take of this as of all, we are so more to into sports law. And my third question is, are there internship opportunities for those who might be interested in going to school? What's your third question, sorry? Are there internship opportunities for those that might be interested in delving into your sport or starting a career in sports? Okay. okay, thank you. Then, um, Don. Do you have a question? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ma'am. Yeah, good afternoon, Don. Thank you for the opportunity, Mrs. Beverly. I took your course, regulatory compliance course on legally engaged. I'm oh, wow. Well. to have you here. <laughs> That's nice. My first <laughs> question is um, for sports law. It's, for me, it's a really um, new area. I know. I've seen you on it online on Instagram a couple of times talk about it. But what are or how can we as young lawyers delve into that area of law? Like what are some of the um the ways we can get into that area and how can we learn about it? Then when we eventually get into that space, what are the areas you can actually specialize in that area of law? That's my second question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You can respond to them now. Thank you very much. Okay, okay, great. So thank you so much. Your questions were really um, enlightening and also typical areas that I think people who are starting out would actually want to know. So the first question, which is, um, you know, um, you see that sports is kind of an amalgamation of existing laws. So not existing laws, existing practice areas. So you're not, you're not wrong at all. For me, I think sports law is more of just a label. It's a label from, a, from an industry perspective of the practice of law in a specific industry. But really what's happening is you're doing kind of the similar things you'd be doing in other industries. So you're drafting contracts, you're doing intellectual property, you're doing even, um, uh, how do I say, um, capital financing, you're doing um, tenancy, you're doing you know, construction, you're doing so many of the normal things that you would do without that label of sports law. So sometimes the sports law label it can it, it can be it can be good and it can be bad. It can be bad from the perspective that it makes us. It, most people start thinking, sadly, narrow-mindedly. They think, okay, what what could sports will be about? It's just football. It's not. It's so much more than just football. But the positive thing is, it's just it's a label you give to the practice of law 
in sports related industry. So I'll give you an example. Sports law, I'll say now, is wider than football. I know in Nigeria, when you hear sports law, the first thing you think of is football. But actually, like someone like me, we practice, we do sports law with um, we we um have um clubs, football clubs. We have gymnastics clients. We have swimming, a swimming director is one of our clients. We have a sports tech company that gathers data on um on you know on clients on consumers. So sports is really really broad. You know, there's the media and broadcasting side as well of sports. is It's really really extensive. So I would say that in Nigeria, what is obtainable? Let's look at the landscape here in Nigeria. What do we have around us? We have more and more people are beginning to invest into sports. And when I say invest, I mean physical infrastructural investment. So in fact, right now, we have a client in the swimming industry who is doing some capital financing for like a massive sports swim center, for an example. So if sport wasn't on, if, if it wasn't a uh, sport, it would just be uh, capital financing for a uh, property. But because it's in the context of sport and it's for a particular sport, it then becomes, you know, it has that sports label. So you can actually just go into infrastructure developments as a sports lawyer. You could just, all you're doing is you're just helping to put contracts together, construction related contracts, and you're doing financing agreements in the, in the sports context, because with sports, the thing about sports is unless you're doing uh, e-sports, you need physical places to play. And we all know that in Nigeria, especially Lagos, which has 21 million people, there is, there is a there is a terrible um, deficit of infrastructure for the 21 million people that are in Lagos. I'm, I'm sure you're all in different parts of the country. I don't want to assume you're all in Lagos, but we all know that there's a massive infrastructure, sports infrastructure deficit. There's not enough places for people to participate. So what we anticipate is more and more people will invest into sports infrastructure. The lawyers will have to draft the agreements. The lawyers will have to draft the financing agreements. You know, so sports is not just playing football. It's beyond that. Then there's the intellectual property side. Sport is something that people do to, to pass time for recreation, but it's also something they do professionally. And with anything, whether professional or recreational, one thing that we humans know is we recognize things visually. We recognize certain games. If we see a, a specific board game, we, we, we know it by the brand. If we see um, a, a logo or a brand of, a, of a, your favorite EPL club, you recognize it because that brand carries its own value. So uh, intellectual property rights and the exercise of those rights, the protection and enforcement of those rights is massive in sport. Here in Nigeria, I know we have a massive issue with, um, say, um, what's it called? What's it called again? It skipped my mind. <laughs> oh, goodness me. It's, the, word, the word is not coming, but um, it counterfeits. Yes, we have a massive problem in Nigeria with counterfeiting. It's a huge problem. But one thing I do like is I'm beginning to see more homegrown domestic sports brands coming up because we can't remain a consumer, a consuming nation forever. So we're seeing a lot of local um, companies that are bearing their own local brands, whether it's athleisure wear, you know, now what are the young people wearing? To be honest, you don't even have to be young. A lot of people are wearing athleisure clothing because it's comfortable. We're seeing more domestic Nigerian brands emerging in that market they need um, intellectual property protection so ip is huge with, with sport because sport is um depending on what area of sport you're going into whether it's manufacturing or whether it's clothing or um you know or um, say it's a sports center it has to have a, a a source identifier how do i recognize that business the name of that business the brand the colors so IP is huge in sports, as you know. And then obviously we can't go, we can't do anything without contracts. So there's a lot of contracts. 
And don't forget, sport is a huge employer of people. Fine, we may not have the data to back up the exact figures, how many people are employed in sport in Nigeria. We may not know, but believe you me, there, there are people, there's millions of people employed by, in sport. So there are contracts to be, to be drafted, employment contracts, you know, um, Again, one, the, the, I know it might feel like the sports terrain in Nigeria is very much like the wild, wild west, but there lies the opportunity. You can meet someone today who is ready to invest, say, 100 million. He wants to set up a sports business. He wants everything done properly. As a sports lawyer or even as a regular lawyer, you can say, look, I can help you with your corporate governance. I can help you with your legal and compliance. I can help you with intellectual property. I can help you with your employment um, contracts because let's face it, sports business will still, um, will still be subject to the same labor laws as a business in tech sector or in health or in whatever. They, they're still gonna be um, um, subject to the same laws. So in that regard, someone working in sports industry still needs the services of um, a lawyer that's competent enough to understand you know what the implications of those laws are so I find that a sports lawyer really has to have quite a good understanding of quite a wide variety of things you have to be good with your labor laws you have to be good with your intellectual property you have to be on top of your contract drafting because contract drafting can get quite it can get quite um, tricky when you're dealing, you know, you're going from infrastructure one day, development one day, to, um, to say a training academy, you need to prepare contracts for maybe um, the, club, the club players, or you need to prepare, say, sponsorship agreements. Sports is so broad. That's why I actually like it. It's very broad. So, um, so I think what's obtainable is anything is possible because we are right now on the cusp of like a huge advancements. Everybody's eyes have opened, so to speak. So a lawyer that can demonstrate a lot of knowledge, like breadth of understanding of the various areas of law and can apply those well would do well as a sports lawyer because you need to, you need to be able to demonstrate multiple um, skills and versatilities. So, so yeah, I would say the opportunities are there. I mean, you can work in a, a sports media company. You've got media houses here, haven't you? You've got the likes of um, Supersport. You've got the likes of DSTV. You've got the likes of all these channels. They're all here. You've got um, um, on, um, online media as well. They would need lawyers too. You've got all sorts of projects going on, ad hoc projects annual project so there's a lot of room there's a lot of um, opportunity i would say for people to go into um sports law and get some solid experience you may not be as in-depth as the west so where i would say things are lacking is with regards to say arbitration so for me my preference is adr for sports we wouldn't expect to see anyone go into a normal court of law, a conventional court to settle a dispute. So one thing you need to be mindful of is any contracts that you're drafting should have the right ADR clauses there, triggering, say, a mediation in the event that a dispute arises and worst case, an arbitration. So one thing where we lack here in Nigeria is we're far behind in terms of um, sports sports ADR, it even, it even reflects when you look at court of arbitration for sports, less than, less than three Nigerians also registered there currently. And yeah, blacks, you know, not many, not many blacks at all. So in that regard, yeah, we're a bit behind, but if people begin to come in now, you begin to build your expertise, you begin to understand from the outset that, you know, any sports contracts I'm drafting should have proper ADR clauses, mediation should kick in, then it will create that uh, pool. So I would advise anybody here, if they've not considered it, you know, to consider um, getting qualified as a mediator or an arbitrator. But to be honest, media, a mediator, because mediation is more accessible here 
you know, there's no politics about being a mediator in Nigeria. It's, it's honestly, all you have to do is just take the, pay for the course, do your, do your, um, uh, what's it called? Your, what do I, I don't know, I keep forgetting these names. You go through your, the process <laughs> and then after the period is done, I think it's a year, you then get inducted into the panel of neutrals. And then they start calling you to come and mediate. And one thing I'm campaigning for is LCA, LMDC, that's Lagos multi Door Court House, Lagos Court of Arbitration. Maybe I'll come and talk to the Abuja um, multi Door. They need to have separate sections for sports. And I've said this time and time again, we've got family section, we've got banking and capital market section, we've got tenancy, landlord and tenancy section. We need to create sports and entertainment sections in our multi-door courts. Because guess what? It will also give confidence to the stakeholders in that, in that sector that, ah, if I have a dispute, I know where I'm going. I'm going to the multi-door court. So a lot of awareness still needs to be done. But yeah, that's what I would say anyway. So very multidisciplinary. Um, there's a lot to do. You could spend all your time even just doing intellectual property. I'm telling you, because that's the first thing that a lot of these sports businesses need. So yeah, to, that, to answer that question by the first lady, yeah, there's a lot you can get involved with. Policies as well. So much policy work to be done. Then the guy that said, oh, passion, I'm not sure who asked that. I see someone called Daniel. Daniel, do I want to assume that it's you that said compassion alone? Okay, nice to see you. Okay, let's put it this way. You need a, you need a dose of passion. Like in everything you do in life, you need a bit of fire to, to propel you because things will not always go smoothly. When you start, there's that euphoria, there's that like energy and then times will come when things are not going well and you don't want to give up too soon so it's that's when the passion kicks in so the passion itself is obviously not enough to see you through a successful career but passion is what could help keep you in there for the long haul but what really keeps you in there is a, a, a willingness to learn, a willingness to learn about the industry. I find that the sports industry is a very, very commercial industry. You have to be commercially savvy. You need to know what is going on. I mean, I subscribe to over five, even 10 sports business um, um, news agencies. Yeah, I get about 10 sports business subscriptions coming into my email every day so i don't miss a beat i know what is going on locally internationally so that way the ideas keep churning i know where to you know make my moves you have to stay one step ahead and that is passion passion i think the word has been um it's been abused it's been thrown around so I don't think we even know what the word means anymore. But passion is still a lot. Passion is still 50%. Because it is passion that makes me want to find out more about the industry. If I didn't care, then I would just say, I'm all right where I am and I'll carry on. The little I'm doing, I'll manage. But passion, I want to know as much as I can possibly know. I want to make the right connections in this industry. It's passion. So don't look at passion like some, some, some random, it's not a fruit you just pluck somewhere and as long as, no, it's, it, it's drive. Passion is another word for drive. Passion is another word for ambition. If you are ambitious, if you have drive, if you are committed, all those words for me are synonymous with passion. I think it might be because we've heard one too many motivational speakers um, use that word. So it means nothing anymore. But if you look up the meaning of passion, um, um, commitment, drive, ambition, thirst for knowledge, solutions oriented 
that is all passion in different words. And those will all get you where you need to go to. I'm not fully where I need to get to, but I think I'm on my way because I keep demonstrating a, a commitment, like me being on this call, even though I've been in traffic for four freaking hours. <laughs> and I'm still, you know, that's passion because I need to teach people that are coming up after me. Some people may not, some be, I think we've, we've had um, loads of complaints from the, from the youth, not just the youth, even my generation about the older generation not sharing enough knowledge. They don't share, they don't share. That's another problem we have with certain practices, niche practices in Nigeria, like arbitration. Why is it that in Nigeria, we only have less than 10 arbitrators, why? Why is that knowledge not being handed down? Why is it like such a small network of people, same people every time, every time? So we need to be passing this information down. That is passion, passion to share knowledge, not just passion for your own personal ambition, passion to also bring others up behind you. Because what's the point of there being one top sports lawyer in Nigeria, 10 top sports lawyers, and then what happens to everybody else? So I hope that answers your question, Daniel. Passion counts for a lot. It just depends on what you think passion is. Passion to me means many, many things. Knowledge, commitment, sharing, you know? And yes, be ambitious for yourself, but also bring others along with you. Because I find that in this sports um, career that I kind of found myself on, the more I've brought others along with me, the more I seem to move along because, I don't know, it's just like an attraction thing. When you bring others with you, like they also carry you, you know, you end up getting referrals. Like a lot of my sports law clients, they were referrals. I didn't even have to look for them. They just said, oh yeah, um, we, we got your number from this guy in NFF because, you know, and I'd only met him once, but, suppose he liked the way I spoke and so yeah passion for people I have I'm very passionate about people very passionate about people so again I think that's what's also helped me along my career so I hope that helps um there was another question I'm I, I'm beginning to forget <laughs> sorry in this as I'm getting older I keep forgetting things I need to take ginkgo biloba um or oh, is it stress I don't know and also rest <laughs> um he also asked if you have a program for those who want to come into your space that's the sports law space oh a program oh wow well i know i take interns but it tends to get full quickly like i've already got two um coming in i don't know i keep saying to myself i need to create some kind of program like a wider program because you can't just focus on few people at once. So maybe it's something I'll have to give consideration to um, how to train more people at once. But please look out for the MBA. I don't know if you're, 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 you're law students. You're not yet lawyers, are you? Otherwise, I would have said, actually, it shouldn't matter. Some lawyers, actually. Some are okay. already practicing. So we have, okay. some that we have some that are practicing already. Okay, so could I please implore you all to join the NBA SBL, um, uh, what's it called, committee, sports, entertainment and media. I'm the vice president, I'm the vice chair of that committee and I've been quite pushy on training. In fact, we had one two weeks ago, we had a, a training on opportunities for lawyers in sports, entertainment and blockchain. So if you join that committee, you will get updates on training. There's even another one coming up where I'm going to do um, a session on contracts, contracts in sports and entertainment, different types of contracts. Because I get people asking me, oh, can you help me out with contracts? And, you know, so you need, one thing I, I find is you need to join relevant, like the same way Juliana has so amazingly put together this program because she recognizes that mentorship is important. So it behoves on everybody to join as many groups as possible. It's so important. You need multiple, like, my goodness, I have so many groups. That's how I stay updated as well. That's how I learn because I'm still learning. I keep learning. I keep learning. So 
you need to join um, your relevant professional group. So do join your, um, the sports and entertainment group. And also there's, if you go on LinkedIn, there's other sports law groups. There's so many sports law groups now where you can get access to information and things. So the more groups you join, quality groups, the more information you have access to. How do they explain so, it? Sorry. How, how so, people... I mean, so some of them are free. Not all. I know some of them are not free, but okay. Do, I mean, I mean, one called Women in Sports Law. Okay, that one is a bit. Okay, no, Women in Sports Law is not too expensive. Although it's in Switzerland, so you need to pay in Swiss francs. But it's like 50, it's like 50 Swiss francs, which is, can be up to 20K, you know, for a year or something. Then um, obviously SBL, please, SBL is right at your doorstep. So join SBL, Sports Entertainment Media. Um, it plan. As, um, okay, what I'll do is I'll send you Endurance's number, Endurance's contact. You can forward it to everybody else. Endurance, Endurance is the secretary for all, in fact, he coordinates all the committees in NBA. SBL means section of business law. And you guys, I don't know where you are. Juliana, you're in Abuja, right? Yes, I'm in Abuja. Yeah, Abuja has, it's like, Abuja has a very active um, sports, um, sports law, sports and entertainment law um, committee because I was asked to speak twice with the Abuja um, as, um, SBL sports committee. So join Abuja. If you're based in Abuja as a lawyer, join your Abuja branch. I will give you two numbers, Juliana, a number of someone for Abuja and then the number of somebody in Lagos. So you have access to both. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, just, I mean, follow me on Twitter. I talk a lot about sports issues at maxib m-a-x-x-y-b i'm always chatting about sports issues i follow i make sure i follow um people in sports law and entertainment i follow a lot of my peers in nigeria i also follow international people i follow the best sports lawyers on the planet so I'm all, I'm staying constantly updated on what's happening. You learn by the people, the people you surround yourself with, right? That's that's really a determining factor of how far you will go. Because you say who you you're, you're like ten percent of the of the people you surround yourself with, or something like that. So I really try to make sure that whoever I'm following on social media, um, I'm following the right people because the right people will always share great knowledge you, i mean you can follow me on linkedin if you're not already following me because i tend to post and share there as well so so yeah that that's kind of what i would advise thank you very much beverly um i think you've answered almost every question but if there's one question you have that she has not answered please quickly ask it before she leaves because she has she has been gracious enough to uh, <laughs> stay and to really pour out her um, knowledge to us. So, so is there anyone here that has any question that she hasn't touched yet? Maggie, Daniel, Rebecca, Don. Okay. So I guess that you've actually touched almost everything and I'm happy that you also shared your handle and um, places where they can join to get more knowledge about sports law. And I'll just say something. I actually did my master's in entertainment and sports law here in Nigeria. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I'll share with you, for the sports law, I don't think they even scratched the surface. Oh dear. Do you know what? I actually want I if I had the opportunity, I wouldn't mind lecturing. I like because I feel like the the people don't teach it well. And you know, if I could add my quota, I wouldn't mind lecturing on sports law because it's so much. It's so much. So yeah, I'm, I'm putting it out there. <laughs> I think I'll even chat with you after now, probably when okay. you rested and relax and when I'm done with the session. Um, thank okay. you so much, Beverly. I know You're welcome. 30 minutes, but you almost spent an hour. You're just um, eight 
minutes to an hour. Shy. Okay. Uh, yes, I am so grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you so My much. My pleasure. So Best we'll be of luck to everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Take you. Care. Take care. Take care. My gosh. You I'm too. Sure. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Okay, so quickly, we will just take, um, so we might just take two reports so that Mrs. Uche can listen to it and then give quality comments on it. And then if there is still time, we'll take another one. So let's start with Daniel. Um, Daniel, so you have five minutes to present. And then um, the next person will also make her presentation. Daniel, you're muted. Okay. Can we get someone else to start presenting while you're getting set? Can I start? Yes, yes, please. Maggie starts. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let me see. Sharing my screen, it's a bit of a problem. Okay. Uh, but I think I sent through the presentation. Um, yes, you did. Um, although I may not be able to share it from here also because okay. my has an issue. Okay. But you can go ahead to present. So, yeah, I only have five minutes. Yes. Okay, let me see if I can do it in five minutes. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, my apologies for being off for two weeks. I had to go home for a few days. Uh, my topic is on indigenous knowledge and IP. I don't know why I, I chose this topic, but I feel like I wanted to challenge my, myself because it's one of those topics that I really I'm passionate about, but sometimes I really find it difficult to understand. So I really just wanted the mentors to really see if I'm on the right track or not. So I'm, I might not go deep into it, but I will see how far I go. Um, so um, I'm going to use abbreviation TK or IK because in uh, different countries, either use traditional knowledge or indig indigenous knowledge. So there are uh, provisions that were given um, under different legislation, like the UN General Assembly for the rights of indigenous knowledge and the IGC for WIPO and um, the Convention of Biodiversity, which states that parties should uh, subject to national legislation, respect, preserve and maintain knowledge and innovative and practices of indigenous and local people. And the Nangoa protocol that talks about access and benefit sharing and the ITPGRFE. Um, according to research, there's not really a definite definition yet or a general universal definition on what is indigenous knowledge or TK. But um, what is so far has been written is that it's knowledge or know-how or skills or innovative practices that has been passed between generation in the traditional context and that form part of the traditional lifestyle of indigenous and local communities who act as their guardian or custodians. So traditional knowledge can either be knowledge about traditional medicines or traditional hunting or fishing techniques or um, knowledge about animal migration patterns or knowledge about water management. For somebody that grew up in the village like me, there are certain ways that uh, we manage our water systems that can be of benefit if it's um, developed correctly. And um, there are different ways that we can protect traditional knowledge. It can either be... Hello, can I continue? Yes, please. Okay. There are different ways um, that uh, I, TK or IK can be protected, which is either defensive protection where uh, third parties or people outside the communities um, uh, are not given the right 
to, to acquire the IP rights of the, over the traditional knowledge, or it can either be positive protection with grants, which is the granting of rights that empowers communities to promote their traditional knowledge and also help um, explore the TK by the original community itself. Or it can also be in a form of an agreement where the access and benefit sharing is stated in the Nagoa protocol where that in case somebody comes and find out there's a TK and they are registered and they've registered it, that they should have an agreement with the community so that they can also benefit from their knowledge. So um there is not um there is not really a general registration re legislation yet on how TK should be protected. So countries were given the the freedom to to come up with their own uh, protection because there is no um there is no what is the word there is no um a treaty yet per se so you can either protect your tk over the conventional ip rights which is either uh, patent law or uh, trademark or copyright or you can protect it under trade secret or you can have a sweet generous system or through documentation, which can be protected under copyright or under customary laws or under contracts. Uh, and in Namibia, indigenous knowledge, we do we have a national commission on research, science, and technology that has finalized the draft on international uh, indigenous knowledge system policy. And this policy has gone through all the necessary form uh, policy formulation but it's now with a cabinet for approval. So we're just waiting for it to be approved. And once that is approved, and then we'll be able to use it. So uh, in conclusion is to say that it's high time that researchers really embarked on extensive research and RD activities on, I on indigenous knowledge because there's so much value that we can get on the knowledge from um, that has been passed on from generation to generation. And one of the things that I realized is that we don't really document. For somebody like now I came from the village, I could have taken a pen and a paper and really go and ask you know, questions from my grandparents or from my mom so I can document it. So there's so much value and there's so much knowledge within our own African continent that we can use to develop our country further, but we don't have it documented. So people from the Western or from other countries come and do such research and then they go and pattern the whatever they come, uh, they find out or they, and then they end up getting all the value instead of it coming back to our own continent. So, yeah. I'm done. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maggie, for your presentation. Sorry, I'm having issues with my system. That was why I wasn't able to share it from here. Um, so we'll just go to Daniel. After you're done with your presentation, then we'll take comments from Mrs. Uche. Um, so Daniel, you can start your presentation. But before he starts, I'm now like to say that we would be having the um, person in charge of World Intellectual Property Organization for Nigeria come to speak on traditional knowledge in some weeks. So um, once it's oh, time, that's he, great. yes, so he would talk about this topic very well because that's his own um, specialization. So he'll be talking about traditional knowledge more, um, more in-depthly on um, how to protect it. Yes, so Daniel. Sorry, I'm, I'm having some issues. I don't know. Okay, maybe. You can just go ahead and present then. Okay. Um, I'm trying to see if I could share my screen, but I don't know what happened. Okay. So I wrote on. I wrote on. Um, on well known marks. Unfortunately, I'm not able to share my screen. And um, this protection in Nigeria. Okay, we can see your presentation now. Okay, so I um, I wrote that 
um, looking at Swellum Max, that they are described as foreign, they are described as, sorry, I don't know what's happening. Okay, they are described as a um, foreign trademark that in view of widespread recognition or reputation, enjoys extensive protection than an ordinary mark. I um, Sometimes they are referred to as superheroes because um, they are deemed to have special powers, special protection. Um, according to um, WIPO, as, um, um, there's no, we can't, we can't say there's a particular definition, but for WIPO, WIPO has described it as, um, I said that for one to be able to determine a well-known trademark, we need to look at various factors such as um, the relevant sector of the public and the knowledge and um, and the promotion of um, that same trademark in member states. Um, so um, a mark that is well known in a foreign country definitely might not be well known in Nigeria. There are, there are products that are very well known in foreign country um, country that the Nigerian markets might not have knowledge of them. So um, in such situation, we might not be able to refer to such trademark or that mark as a well-known mark in Nigeria. Um, and we all know that well-known um, trademark are protected territorially. Yeah, so there are reasons why people have argued that they should, we should have protection of well-known mark in, um, in different jurisdiction. For instance, one of such reasons are, um, is um, avoidance of registration and use of a trademark. Um, liable to create confusion on that mark. For instance, um, a, a foreigner who has, uh, has a well-known mark or whose mark is already well-known and his mark is already also well-known in the market just because he has not registered that mark. Um, a, an indigenous person might register that mark and uh, or register a mark that is similar to it, which might actually create confusion or deceit um, in the mind of the public. Of, of course, and that one is unfair competition. Of course, someone who's, who, whose mark has, who, um, a foreigner who, um, who is maybe is trying to have markets in the country and I seen that um, another person has gone ahead to register that same mark or a mark similar to that. Definitely, it's the other person has already has an edge over him when it comes to competition. Then public interest to avoid um, deception, so that people can know the particular brand. As we all know that one essence of trademark is distinguishing. It distinguishes a particular product or service from another. So for people to be able to understand and know the products they are purchasing. Then another one is avoidance of conflict marks getting registered at the detriment of the well-known mark, which is similar to the first one. Um, of course, I also looked at if there are, there's any international convention for provision for well-known mark. Of, definitely we know that even if there is a um, trademark or well-known mark are to be protected territorially. So the fact that an international convention has made provision for a well-known mark does not mean that it is also protected in a particular jurisdiction. Um, the answer, the response from my own research was yes. We have section 6B of the Paris Convention um, that provides that a, a um, that provides for a competent authority to cancel or refuse registration of a trademark that is similar to a well-known mark. That, is, that might be a reproduction, an imitation of a well-known mark, which can cause confusion. Um, then we also, there's a case of McDonald's Corporation and Job Burgers Driving Restaurants. When I read this case, it was a very, very interesting case. Um, I, I think a sum of the case was that McDonald's um, Corporation, um, of course, a, um, um, they had markets, definitely in the South African markets. But as at, as at that time, they had not registered their trademark. In fact, they had others, they had series of issues with a different brand, not even Job Burgers. Then I think along the way, the, um, South Africa now made um, um, provision for the protection of well-known marks. So they were able to bring the case in court and um, act, they, the court was able to interpret and rule in their favor that the the mark registered by Job Burgers, which was similar to the McDonald's mark, was an infringement on McDonald's mark. So with that, the court, um, I think the court ruled that the authority in charge should um, cancel the registration of the trademark, which was similar to McDonald's Corporation. And that was because South Africa had actually incorporated uh, 
um, Section 6B of the Paris Convention. Then we have the um, Article 16.2 of the Agreement on Trade Related Aspects of International Property Rights, which we well know as TRIPS. TRIPS also makes provision for the registration or the protection of well known mark. Um, that is member states, own, and it also provides that member states will have to take into account the knowledge of trademark the, if the public has adequate knowledge of that particular trademark. Um, that is a very, very important factor that should be taken into cognizance when protecting um, well-known mark. Then, um, so now I also look at countries that make provision for well-known mark. We have USA, United Kingdom, Japan, Canada, India, South Africa, and China. I believe that there might be other countries that make provision for protection of well-known marks. Then now I try to narrow it down to our country, to Nigeria. Does is there um well-known does well-known mark enjoy protection in Nigeria? The answer is no. Um, looking at the trademark act, it does not make provision for the registration of well-known mark. So that means um a foreigner or someone else who has a particular product, whose product is already enjoying um, um um, uh, enjoying a large market or enjoying, um, it's already well known, famous in Nigeria, might not enjoy a protection of well known mark if he feels to register the trademark before um, anybody else. Uh, so, um, although Nigeria does not provide for protection of well known mark, it makes provision for something like something called defensive mark under the trademark. Act that's under section 30 of the trademark act, which means that a proprietor of a well-known mark can actually register a trademark even without using it. Um, and I may apply for the of trademark respect of other goods which are registered in his name as a defensive mark. So, in other words, even if he is not using it or he does not intend to use it, he can register that trademark to prevent the usage of that particular trademark by any other person. Um, so I, I think that is, um, for me, my own opinion, um, it's, it's something that can help protect uh, proprietors uh, of well-known marks to prevent the usage of, or to prevent the imitation or reproduction of their particular trademark in the Nigerian markets. Um, so I, in, for me, in conclusion, I believe that the Trademark Act should be amended to reflect or to make provision for protection of well-known marks. Though, although we have defensive mark, but um, I think that defensive mark would encourage what we call trademark clutter. That's clocking up the trademark database with unused trademarks, which might make it um, difficult for people or for proprietors of um, trademarks who actually want to use a particular trademark, it might make it difficult for them to register their trademarks. But however, I believe that when the acts make provision for the protection of well-known marks, it would reassure proprietors of um, reputable known marks that they have added that they, their brands, their trademarks, their efforts will not be in vain and to be adequately protected and to increase foreign investments in Nigeria. That's the end of my presentation. I'm done, Ma. Thank you, Daniel. Yes. Thank you very much, Daniel. So we'll call on Mrs. Uche to respond to these two presentations first. And then if she has um, more time, we can take more presentations. Thank you very much. So let me start with the first presentation on the um, traditional knowledge. Uh, because there's really not much to say there, only because it is exactly what it says, traditional knowledge, and it belongs to the whole community. So if you want to ask who owns that mark, it's the whole community, because it's a way of practice of a particular community. You remember that Onyeka Onweno was, there was a time, not, yeah, a long time ago, when she came out with the song, but these are things that young girls played with folklore and stuff like that. So 
She could do that because she improved on it, but she cannot deprive the community. If somebody else in the community wants to use it, she does not have a right against them because she improved on it. So I guess um, it's also the same thing with other jurisdictions. In America, they have the traditional reading deeds and then their way of doing business and the tribes. And then if the USPT or the US government, they see a need for a particular medicine or something to develop as patent, and they develop it and they can use it for the benefit of all humanity, but they can't use it against the community. The community still owns it. So when you read the history, you will know that it belongs to the community. Um, so that's as much as the traditional knowledge because it's very difficult to really give that right to a single entity because it's the entire community, it's for their benefit. And then, uh, and oftentimes, if it's a particular product that will yield, really yield huge sums of money, then it's only uh, proper that the money is also channeled back to the community to develop the community, maybe their town hall or provide scholarship for the people from that area. So um, that's basically what it is, uh, traditional knowledge. So it's really done on a case by case. The presenter, Maggie, did fantastic work because she alluded to what it is and what it's meant for. And, uh, who owns so I needed to stress on the ownership because ownership you can't really, it's very difficult to determine because it's a whole general community. That's uh, much to change. So, but for Daniel, um, on the well known maps. Okay, Daniel, I think, thank you so much for that presentation. But I think the first thing you will know, uh, I would like you to know that well-known Mac is not registrable. So you won't find it, like you rightly said, under the law in Nigeria. It can't, it can't be anywhere. It cannot be on the register. It's a special recognition. So for instance, the Coca-Cola company, their bottle, the counter bottle is recognized in Nigeria, even not only as a 3D bottle, but, and apart from Coca-Cola, look at Rolex, look at all those well-known marks. Somebody can come to the Nigerian registry and say they want to register a milk or tea called Rolex. They will say no, because it's well-known. So even though it is not on register, the trademark registry, it is recognizable. And how do you do that? There's a special record uh, for it. And if you want the registry to recognize your product as well known, you need to establish certain um, um, there are bases and there are milestones. You need to really show how well known it is. It's based on that that the registry, and it doesn't just apply to Nigeria, any registry. And it's based on that that the registry will now say, oh, even the registrar can tell you, even I am aware of it, that you know that this is well known. It's so well known. And with the internet and e-commerce, uh, Daniel, you did mention that it's territorial. It's not because it's not registered. If it's registered, then it's territorial. And it is so well known that even online, you sit here in Nigeria, people are ordering things from Amazon. Amazon is so well known. And they won't go to other website because they trust Amazon with their logo that sends a smile to you. So that when you get a package, what's the first thing you do? You smile if there's your old grandparents are in the village and it's Hamatan season, and then you send them a nice sweater. And of course, when they see it, so Amazon really did their research to see what they, is associated with their logo. So, um, and it goes with other things, maybe H&M, maybe Zara, and all of those things. Online now, you can stay in Nigeria and know what is happening elsewhere. So the reason we said that trademark is territorial is registration, not use, because there's a difference between registration and use. 
So once you go to register it, then your registration can only protect you in Nigeria because it's first to file. And the same thing happens in other jurisdictions. Um, so in that case, you must establish special circumstances why you should be granted well-known status. So it's not common. And in your own words, uh, Daniel, you mentioned the McDonald case. Of course, that was why they took the mark from the local owners and gave back to McDonald, even though they didn't register, because he's so well known. And the whole idea why the local company went was to reap where they did not sue. They just said that this is a name that if we register it, we will get people to buy uh, our, come to our eateries and buy my, um, hamburger. You see, McDonald's you know, is almost becoming too well known that it's almost sounding as a generic man. Because if you want to eat burger, you say McDonald's. No, McDonald's is a trade mark. It is not the product itself. So just the same thing with, that happened in the days of Walkman. Walkman is somebody's trademark. But then if you had anybody with a speaker and they say it's Walkman. Also, the same thing is happening with Lipton. Lipton is a registered trademark. But if you want it in Nigeria, Malan will say, Get me Lipton. And Xerox, the same thing is also happening with Xerox. So you want to photocopy in your office, Xerox this for me. So Xerox started carrying out a campaign that is a trademark. So you don't make it so generic that it becomes so common that registration cannot protect it. So with the well-known mark, it's left for each jurisdiction to decide what to put in their record of well-known. When I had a client asking whether we have a record story, we don't. But anytime we need to, on a case by case, we go to the registry, they establish it, make your case, and they recognize it as well known, and they can reject um, the other applicant. Daniel, also, you mentioned that in order to attain a uh, well known status, you can do defensive registration. That is not the same thing. Defensive registration is costly, and you rightly said that it clogs the system because you now register marks that you don't need, you don't even use. So if you tell them to register it as a defensive mark, then you're cheapening it. In fact, you're taking it away from the status that is so well known. It's so well known that it doesn't need registration. You know that Rolex is so well known, that Coca-Cola, that McDonald's, that all of these marks are so well known that they don't need registration. Defensive registration, for instance, what happened with Mr. Biggs in Nigeria? They did what is called defensive registration because they know that Mr. Biggs is so good that people just run in for lunch and so they registered Mr. Biggs, Mrs. Biggs, Madam Biggs, Miss Biggs, Boy Big, Girl Biggs. So you can do that, uh, but it's not um, the same as well. Uh, I guess uh, that's my amazing. amazing. Thank you, Ma, for expanding the topic. Um, would you have time to listen to any other presentation, Ma? Let's see. All right. Yeah, quick. If it's five minutes, yes, I can. Okay, perfect. So, um, Don or Rebecca can just quickly make the presentation, but I'll just quickly add that for the for the traditional knowledge, there is there's also cultural expression and all that, and it falls the 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 ownership of the work is belonging to the community, but there's also geographical indication which some communities use to protect their work. And if somebody wants to use it commercially, they are supposed to get maybe like a license from the community to use it and then remit something back to them. So there are cases to that effect. So if you have the time, try to look at cases that talk about traditional knowledge, cultural expression, geographical indication. So I'll just stop there. Um, Rebecca or Dawn? Um, um, okay, okay. Okay. I could. I'm sorry I could not share the slide presentation. Um, so my topic for my project is um, opportunities for software-based inventions via utility models 
in Nigeria. Okay, um, I chose this topic particularly because uh, my interest in intellectual property um, specifically gets towards tech and software development. So um, utility models are a type of intellectual property protection that are similar, similar to taking. Yes, in that they protect innovation, they protect processes and um, methods, tech-related innovations generally. Um, for my research, utility models as a protection for intellectual property is not available in Nigeria. Um, I stand corrected on that note. But well, for my research, I, I found that it's not available in Nigeria. Very few countries actually have adopted it as um, an intellectual property right. Okay, so um, what makes utility model a more preferred choice to patents? Or, or I would say one of the, some of the benefits is the, is the ease in the procedure. Okay, um, we are all aware that patent registration, securing patent registration, especially in Nigeria and in other jurisdictions, is quite difficult compared to um, other intellectual property rights and it's more expensive. Another issue is asserting a claim. Okay. We have to assert the claim that the innovation is um, it's actually inventive and it's, it's not it's not an obvious work and you know the whole idea of novelty. And that's part of the reason why um patent has not been very well appreciated or accepted as a protection for software and mobile applications because when it comes to the software industry, mobile applications, programming, and the rest of it, um, programming codes are more or less universal. Very few programmers are able to come up with um, unique codes, develop codes themselves. So you see programmers using the same codes in strategy. Probably the structure is different, but it is generally difficult to um, assert novelty when it comes to your codes and your programming and hence why people go with copyright instead. But then part of, I think uh, from my research and from my from my whole observation and experiments and seeing and events, I think that this will be a more profitable protection for software development because if you can't really um, protect your code, you can't really assert uniqueness to your code, then the functioning of your software, your mobile application is something that you should be able to claim. Okay, we have, for example, we have different um, online shopping platforms in Nigeria. Most of them have their applications. And we find that the user interface of these mobile applications are totally different. Some are a lot easier, uh, easier to use. Some are more user-friendly in navigation and the rest of it, and their steps are totally different. Now, what would protect the user interface, the functionality of the mobile application, it has to be patent because it has to do with the structure, it has to do with the process, it has to do with the method. Okay, so patent is a more more um, profitable protection than copyright because you can copyright your code and someone else is using a different set of code to achieve the same functionality. There's really no point to it. And um, so being able to protect your functionality via patent is something that attracts the business wise, especially for tech startups in Nigeria, looking at getting angel investors and the rest of it, if you're able to protect the major aspect, the most important aspect of your mobile application, which is your interface, then you're open to more investors. And that, that's a, a much more promising good for the industry. But then again, in, just like in other clients, and more especially in Nigeria, patents is already available for software innovation. Okay? Primarily because computer programs have been written off to copyright and then there's no provision for them under the patent. And like I said before, um, establishing claims of novelty and inventiveness when it comes to, um, to software is difficult. Although there are there have been cases where software innovations have been granted patent registration outside of Nigeria, of course, but it's still a universal issue accepting them under this category of intellectual property rights. And that's where utility models come in. Utility models waters down the criteria for registration 
of um, what would ordinarily qualify for patient registration or should qualify, but is disqualified based on um, novelty, inventiveness, and the rest of the utility model creates an opportunity for these inventions to gain protection as intellectual property. So um, the whole requirement of novelty and inventiveness is watered down in jurisdictions that accept utility models. And in some jurisdictions, it is not, novelty is not even a requirement at all for registration under utility models. Then when it comes to startups that are not yet financially buoyant, utility model is more cost effective, okay? It's, it's easier to, it's easier to acquire, so that less financial constraints on, uh, financial constraints on the developer or business holder. So my, my point of um, highlighting this intellectual property right is, if patent is, 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 is being too much of the difficulty for um, software developers, software-based companies and businesses to gain protection, then I think we should start considering the option of utility models. Although the registration, the protection period for utility models are a lot shorter than patents. I think the the highest in any jurisdiction is about 10, 12 years. But then mobile applications generally do not really fall down for the value of utility because most mobile apps stay relevant for about a period of say 10 years. And even if they stay relevant for that long, I mean, a period of 10, five to 10 years is enough to gain the benefits of the uniqueness of your product before it is open for other people to copy. So I think it's, it's time that we, we shine more light on utility models as an intellectual property right available to software since patent is not readily acceptable. And, and you know, explore other options apart from copyright because really copyright is not sufficient. It, it, it's not a sufficient protection for software and mobile applications as the industry keeps developing and evolving. So that's Thank you very much, Rebecca. Thank you. Um, Dr. Mikema, you can make your comments on her presentation. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I am um, utility model is um, a lower invention. The reason why it's called so is because they can meet the requirements of patent. So it's very important that you distinguish between the two so that you know that utility models can never compete against patent because they are not patents. In Nigeria, we didn't have provision for utility model in our old laws that were already decayed. But in the EPCOM bill that is awaiting a presidential assent, there's provision for utility model because they envisaged that all of those you need to incorporate uh, some of it. Uh, when you mentioned that copyright, uh, please, uh, I, I guess you mean, um, You mean computer software, not the, let me understand. Can you just comment, uh, Rebecca, what you meant by uh, the copyrights and some of the inventions can pass as utility model because they can meet up the requirements. It must be the hard word that you, you're talking about because the softwares okay. are copyrights. Okay, this, what is copyrighted in, or what can be copyrighted under our copyright as is computer programs. And um, I think two weeks ago in my last report, I distinguished between cop, um, computer programs and software technically. So technically they are not the same thing. Computer programs have to do with the code. So they are visual numbers and figures that can pass as visually work to be copyrighted. But software, has to do with the functioning of a set of computer programs. So that's what, what um, the software is what produces the functioning of an app. So how you move from one page to the other page, the presentation of the whole 
mobile application in general is what software covers. So it's more like saying computer programs are a part of software. Yeah, so I just wanted to be sure that I heard that because um, the hardware is will pass a patent. So if you're talking about the yeah. Nigerian inventors, if they can meet the patent in that regard, so it'll be the hardware will go on the utility model when we have it, once the law is passed, but for now we don't. So they can only uh, just apply for patent, even though, uh, as you know, that in Nigeria, that uh, the patent requirements, we can't meet the requirements because even our registry, uh, the examiners are not first in patent uh, matters because for you to be a patent examiner, you must have science backgrounds. Either you read engineering, uh, or you're a pharmacist and stuff like that. Because the reason why that is so is that when you are examining, you will know because you are a person vast in that area. So because of that in Nigeria, our patent examiners, they continue to do courses program because they didn't have that prior background. And because of that, our patent application is as to formality, just to check who is the applicant, what's the name of the patent, blah, blah, blah. And they can compete with any patent that is filed overseas in WIPO and elsewhere. So what we normally do for clients is that when they file in WIPO, they can nominate Nigeria. They want to use it in Nigeria. So you mainly file it. So nothing else is done. They are just claiming priority and date, but not that they will look at the application strictly to see if we miss the patent requirement because patent is expensive and it's not cheap. And then the requirements are pretty stiff because you need to know what you are being granted 20 years to use until it goes to public domain. That at least is some work uh, that is not out there that is new and and other requirements are met. So the utility model is not provided under our laws. It's a lower invention that can be patent. So that's what it is in a nutshell. Thank you very much, Ma. Thank you for, for staying and for taking these three presentations and for sharing your knowledge. We wish you all the best this weekend and for your meeting after this. All the best, Ma. Thank you for joining us today. We are so excited. For nothing, thank you so much. Have a great one. Bye. Bye, Ma. Okay, so we have Max here. Mr. Max is with us. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I know that you said that you were on the road, so we are glad that you are here. We have one last presentation, so I would ask John to make a presentation and then you can comment on it. Um, John, are you ready for your presentation? Hi, Don, are you here? Um, hello, Don, are you here? Are you having technical issues or let me know if you are here. So I'll just give you about 30 seconds, okay? Good afternoon, please, I'm here. Okay. All right, I'm coming, let me share my screen. Okay, so my topic is the importance of IP due diligence in merger and acquisition transactions. Please, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see. Thank you. Okay. So what um, prompted me to pick this topic was I discovered most times during a major and acquisition transaction, most people do not consider doing an IP due diligence. They might do every other check, but IP due diligence is usually what comes last in their mind. Okay, so 
I defined IP due diligence as an as the an audit of an intellectual property owned property assets owned or licensed by a company, business, or an individual, and is usually done by prospective investors or an acquirer, but can and should be done by the business. My reason for stating that it should be done by the business is that it's always good when you know that you're going to have an exit plan later on in the future or just in case, apart from an exit plan, it's always good for companies to conduct IP due diligence, have a list of their intellectual property assets, have a register where they document everything relating to their IP. And considering how IP has grown over time, this is one area that um, people should pay serious attention to. And then I also stated that um, a company's IP can actually drive it forward or backward because a company's IP can actually generate revenue for it, especially when they give out licenses and all. So they can actually use their intellectual property to generate a lot of revenue. So this is one area they should look at. Then there was a case study in 1998, Volkswagen bought um, the assets of Rolls Royce for $900 million. And they discovered after the deal that Rolls Royce trademark was not included. And they started battling it with um, BMW. So, and they made a press conference later on, Volkswagen made a press conference that if they had known that the um, trademark was not included in the whole transaction, they would have bought their assets for such a huge amount of money. And it was, they would have really wanted to get their trademark. So all of these regrets and all could have been avoided if they had done an IP due diligence. So they would have known, oh, <clears throat> this, the trademark is not included in all of this. So while sitting down and having meetings on, oh, want to buy your assets, want to do this, want to do that, they should have also, if there was an IP due diligence, they would have noticed that there was no um, trademark included in the deal. So these are some of the things that um, companies are supposed to have at the back of their mind. Then the importance of an IP due diligence in major is that the first thing is that it helps you know the amount of IP owned by the business. You know, okay, they, they have so-so and so intellectual property, and then you can ascertain the ownership. It's not just about knowing their IP, you know that the IP actually belongs to them and you are not buying, um, you are not purchasing something bad at the end of the day. You are not having it in mind that, oh, this IP belongs to them, not knowing that they were actually granted the IP or the license or just got it from somewhere and then they were using it. So you are able to detect, oh, this, the ownership of the IP. And then you can, you would also know if the IP infringes on any other intellectual property rights. And if they have a freedom to operate, then you also know, okay, this IP, Ajay litigation associated with it, is it free? And you can also, doing an IP audit also helps you monitor your IP and know if the, the rights on your IP has been infringed on. And then it saves you costs and you get value for your money during this transaction. So you get value like the, the case study. You don't come back regretting later saying, oh, if I had known that this and this, you know, you, you would have known from the beginning, from the get go that, oh, this is this and this and this are what we're purchasing. And then what we would have loved to acquire, we have gotten it. So um, an IP due diligence can be conducted through the following means by setting up an IP due diligence strategy, determining the IP ownership, conducting search at the registry, examining their IP register, that's of the company if they have one, and then reviewing various IP contracts that the company has actually gone into too. You can also trace ownership here and then carrying out an IP valuation. Then in conclusion, um, when dealing with businesses during merger, 
merger and acquisition transaction, it's always important to emphasize the need to conduct an IP due diligence, either from the purchasing company or from the company itself, from the company itself to protect yourself, and then from the purchasing company more so they don't um, encounter loss and they get value for whatever they're purchasing. And it also helps them identify any weakness that might be in the IP portfolio of that company. So you know, oh, no, the, the company thought that they had already acquired ownership to this IP, not knowing that it does not really belong to them. So you save yourself from those little, little um, stress along the way. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, so we'll just move to Mr. Max, and he'll be making his comments on your presentation. Mm -hmm. You're welcome, Mr. Max. Thank you for finding the time to join mm -hmm. us today. Yeah, thanks, uh, Juliana. And uh, thanks, uh, Don, for a very good presentation. I'm particularly glad to see how well you designed your slides. So I congratulate you for that, John. Well Thank done. you, sir. Yeah, and also thanks for choosing a very good topic. IP due diligence is a very important, um, a very important aspect of IP law. Uh, it's more so uh, become important, and you know, in the light of um, businesses finding that increasingly the real value of most businesses is trapped actually in their IP and not necessarily in their physical goods and. Um, uh, such things. You gave a wonderful case study, which underscores the point. Like I always tell people, um, imagine if tomorrow I suddenly have the right to, you know, put the Coca-Cola trademark on 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 bottles of water. Instantly, I'm going to become, you know, a billionaire. Instantly, the very next day. And the company, for instance, I was bottling the uh, Coca-Cola products in Nigeria, called Nigerian bottling company. The moment they lose the right to put that trademark on their bottles. It doesn't matter how good the quality of what they are producing is, what people are going to be drawn to is the trademark and that association with the Coca-Cola brand. So uh, doing an IP due diligence is, um, you know, in a, um, in an, in a major acquisition transaction is, is hugely important. Now, another reason why it's important is beyond the positives, there's also the negative part. If you do an IP due diligence, for instance, you will find out if the um, company you are acquiring, for instance, already has some liability, you know, it's using somebody's um, patent without having paid royalties, it's using somebody's trade, uh, infringing on someone, you know, on copyrights, for instance, a very good example is you are buying a tech company, for instance, and that tech company has designed its proprietary software, which is a software that I am hoping to actually use to make money. And part of the code used to design that software is from open, you know, from, uh, from, from a software got through free and open source licensed software. And of course, you know that the conditions on which you license a free and open source software is that you would also make the code available to others to use, you know, free of charge, just like you also got it free of charge. So that means the, the software code you are buying in that transaction is contaminated by free and open source software code. So you need to know on time, you know, make appropriate um, uh, remedies, either uh, uh, exclude that those software codes from your proprietary software or you know at least renegotiate the deal based on that. So it, it's important to list you know on both ways. Same thing also you, you don't want to acquire a company and find out they're infringing patents or infringing um, uh, designs of some other company and all of that. So it's it's actually a, a, you know a very good topic and I thank you for how you presented the topic. So thank you Juliana and back to you. Okay um thank you very much for um Mr. Max for your presentation. Thank you, John, for your presentation. And thank you to all the mentees. I think almost everyone used the PowerPoint for their presentation. Thank you for trying. I know it's not easy to sit down and start designing it, but thank you for doing that. And then thanks to everyone who came early for Beverly's presentation on sports law. I'm sure that we learned like um, a lot of things from that particular session. Because she talked about her journey to the sports space and how she was able to um, grow her practice. So I'm sure that we've learned a lot. Um, next week, we'll be having Maria come to talk to us about alternative dispute resolution for domain name with the World Intellectual Property Organization. 
She was also mm -hmm. here for um, the first session and she'll be that's for the first quarter and she'll be here again. So it's important that we all read about her topic, come with our questions and be ready to engage. Um, so we'll be ending the um, mentoring class for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Max. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Christina, for joining us. Um, I wish all of you a lovely weekend. Please rest and um, take care of yourself and your families and stay safe. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Ma. Bye. Right, thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye, Ma. Bye, everyone. We love you, Ketuazo. All right. Thank you. Take care.